My name is Rick Renner, and I'm in Ephesus, sitting in the ruins of what was called the School of Tyrannus. You say, what is the School of Tyrannus? Well, you can read about it in Acts chapter 19. The School of Tyrannus was a small building. It was a lecture hall or a school very close to the synagogue. And the synagogue previously stood behind me where the library now stands. This is the Celsus Library, which was built in the year 110. But previous to that, there was a synagogue there. And in fact, if you look at the facade of the library, someone about 2,000 years ago etched a menorah into the facade of the library to commemorate the fact that once it had been a synagogue. Well, Paul had taught in that synagogue, and once he was finished there and he knew it was time for him to leave the synagogue, the Bible says he left and entered into the school of Tyrannus, and that's where I am. The school of Tyrannus wasn't very far from the synagogue. Paul just went a few steps away to begin the next part of his teaching ministry. And the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 19 that in this very location, can you imagine right here, the Apostle Paul taught every day of the week, in the mornings and in the afternoons, the Word of God to whoever wanted to hear him. He taught so many people in this location so regularly and so thoroughly that Acts chapter 19 tells us all of Asia, because of that profound teaching ministry, came to know the name of Jesus. It doesn't mean all of Asia was converted, but because of Paul's teaching ministry, they all were informed about Jesus. They came to know about the name of Jesus. And Paul, for two years, taught the foundations of faith. He taught Christ from the Old Testament, talked about the anointing, talked about the work of the cross, the power of the resurrection. He put people on a solid foundation because he knew people needed to have a doctrinal foundation for their lives. Do you know doctrine? Do you know what the Bible teaches you? You need to really be established on a strong foundation because whatever your foundation is, it has to support the rest of your life. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. As we've seen, that word disciple is the Greek word mathetes, a very important word in the New Testament. The word mathetes can be translated student. I really think probably the best translation would be learner. So when you read about Jesus' 12 disciples, the word mathetes really means Jesus' 12 learners. But we translate it disciple because they didn't just listen they weren't just learners, but they had a discipline in what they were learning. They intended to do something with what Jesus taught them. And Jesus never just gave them an intellectual lesson. When Jesus taught the disciples something, then he sent them out to do it. And we're going to see today that God calls us not to be a hearer only of the word, but we need to find a way to do what the Bible says. You can do whatever you're hearing. You can take what you're going to hear from me today and do something with it. There'll be instruction for you today that you can apply to your life. And we're going to begin in James chapter 1. We're going to pick up where we left off in the last program. But first, I want to tell you about my book, Promotion. Today, we're offering this wonderful book, 10 Guidelines to Help You Achieve Your Long-Awaited Promotion. This is the book I wish I had before I started my own business, my own ministry, our own organization. It is just filled with practical advice. And by the way, huh, the advice in this book cost me something. I made a lot of mistakes. I learned a lot of things to do, to not do. And from years and years of experience, I wrote this book. And I want to read to you just a few pages from this book. Doing nothing results in nothing. <laughs> That's a revelation. Doing nothing results in nothing. If I want to reap glorious results and achieve grandiose victories in my life, I have to put in the effort to make it happen. Knowing this is the case, I've built my work ethic on the principle and promise of Proverbs 28, verse 19, which says, if you work your field, you'll have abundant food. Or a paraphrase is, if you work, you'll be blessed. But Proverbs 28, verse 19 also says that the one who chases after fantasies will have his fill of poverty. Who are these fantasy chasers this verse is talking about? Fantasy chasers are those who dream of success but never do anything to achieve it. They sit at home doing nothing significant with their lives, yet all the while they fantasize about how someday they'll get a big break and success will arrive at their doorstep. 
This isn't just a harmless fantasy. This is as unreal as the hallucinations of someone on drugs. These people talk of success, dream of success, wait for success, but they can kiss this mirage goodbye. Because if they're not willing to get up and get to work and put out the effort to attain goals, their dreams of success will never come to pass. It's nothing more than a fantasy. There are two major differences between the two different types of dreamers. One person dreams and works very hard to achieve his dream. The other person dreams but does nothing except fantasize and indulge in wishful thinking. Although these two types of dreamers are different in many ways, one big inward driven difference between the two is their level of desire. Desire is an intense inward appetite to achieve something, a hunger, a craving, a longing, a thirst that causes a person to yearn and lust for a certain goal or objective. This inward desire is so strong that it becomes a driving aspiration an all-consuming ambition that doesn't know how to stop until it obtains the coveted prize. Desire can become so powerful that it literally compels you to get up and take the necessary action to make your dream come to pass. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul instructed Timothy on how to choose leaders for his church in Ephesus, and he listed desire at the very top of the list. Now that is amazing to me because he listed many things, but Paul put desire at the very top of the list. Listen to this. If you lack desire, if you lack desire, it won't take too much to knock you down, knock you out, or even throw you clear out of the ring. One little push from the enemy and you'll give up. The first time you encounter a little opposition and resistance, you'll go scrambling back to your comfort zone where you feel safe and secure without inward desire that is stronger than the opposing forces that are certain to come against you, you are in a heap of trouble. Desire is absolutely essential in your life. Or if you're looking for someone for a leading position, look for people who have desire. Talent is not enough. Brains is not enough. That's good. But there's a lot of unsuccessful, lazy, talented people. You need someone who has an appetite a desire. And by the way, if you're lacking that, you can ask the Holy Spirit to give that to you. He'll give you supernatural desire to rise up out of your situation and be more than you are. That's just a little taste of what is in this remarkable book. I want you to order it. Just use the information that's available. Contact us and we'll get it right to you. And by the way, if you have a prayer request, let us know how to pray for you. We're people of prayer and we would be delighted to pray for you. But today we're going to go back to James chapter 1. We're going to pick up where we left off in the last program. And in James chapter 1, verse 22, James is telling us that we need to be disciples, not just listeners. Listen to what he says in verse 22. He says, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself and goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. This verse is amazing. Let's go back to verse 22 and review it very quickly. First of all, he says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. And we saw in the last program that that word doers is the Greek word poieo, and it carries the idea of creativity. James is literally saying, if you can't conveniently find a way to do what's been preached to you, then find a way to do it. For example, if somebody's been preaching to you about healing, don't just sit there and say, well, that was really good. Do it. Go out and lay hands on somebody. Do what you've heard. If you've just heard a message on holiness, do it. Find a way to be more holy in your life, to make changes in your life that will be reflective of a holy lifestyle. Whatever you're hearing, you can do. Now, the word do, the Greek word poieo, means you may have to get creative in the doing of it, but you can be creative. It's not enough just for you to hear. Jesus calls you to be a mathetes, a disciple, a learner, a disciple who intends to apply what you have received. And that's why he continues in verse 22 to say, and not hearers only. We saw the word hearers only in Greek as one word, akroetes, which described a student, a real student, just like all the other students, 
but he wasn't serious. This was a student who just showed up so they would count him present and it would be obvious on the role that he attended class. He's there physically, but mentally he's checked out. He's somewhere else. And I told you this is the way I was when I was a college student in my zoology class. I could care less about zoology. But for me to pass, I had to take a zoology course. So I was there, I was faithful, I was in my chair, and I wasn't listening to one thing being taught in that class. In fact, to be honest, I can't tell you right now anything I heard or learned in zoology. It just wasn't my deal. I loved journalism. I loved Greek. I loved history. I thrived in those classes. I gave it my attention. I studied it. I applied it. But in zoology, I could care less about what animals have vertebrae and what animals don't have vertebrae. It just was not interesting to me. And so I was physically present, but mentally I was not there. I was a hearer only, or this word really could even be translated just an attender. And in verse 22, James really is asking us a question. What kind of believer are you? Are you a doer? Are you a methetes? Are you a learner? Are you really a disciple doing something with what's being preached? Are you serious about it? Or are you just showing up so it can be marked that you were present? You're in church, but you have no intention to really do anything with what's being preached. You're listening. Maybe it's even entertaining. You might even laugh some but you have no real intention to do anything with what you've heard. If that's you, then you are a hearer only. And the end of verse 22 says, you're probably deceiving yourself, deceiving your own selves. Paralogizomai is a Greek word, which was used in the world of libraries to describe a librarian or a scholar who made a miscalculation. Those scholars would put documents side by side, they would analyze them, and then they would come to a conclusion. But this word, deceiving your own selves, the Greek word paralogizomai, is the picture of a scholar who has made a miscalculation or he's come to a wrong conclusion. And in this verse, James is really saying, if you think everything is going to be swelled just because you've come to church, you have made a tragic miscalculation. You don't understand. It's not just the hearing of the word that changes you. You've got to do it. It's when you do the word of God that its power is released. And then beginning in verse 23, he describes the person that hears only. Listen to what he says. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. The word glass is really the word for a mirror, a mirror. So here he is, he's getting up in the morning, walks into the bathroom or wherever his mirror is, he looks in the mirror, looks at his natural face. You know what the Greek says? The Greek actually says he looks at the face he was born with. Well, when most of us look at the face we were born with, we wish we could trade it for another face or we wish we had lost weight, or we wish that we could have a face lift, most of us see things about our face that we don't like. And that's exactly the picture which now James gives us. This man gets up, he goes to the mirror, he looks in the mirror, ugh, he immediately sees what he needs to fix. He needs to shave, needs to brush his teeth, needs to work on himself. He beholds himself, is how the King James Version says, wow, there it is. He sees his face with all of its flaws, the face that he was born with. But rather than give attention to it and take action to change something, what does he do? The verse says, verse 24, For he beholds himself and goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. He says, wow. I need to make a change. Hmm. One of these days I'll do that. And he goes his way. Rather than stay there and deal with it, he delays change. You know, in my life, I've lost weight many times. And I identify with people who struggle with their weight. I know what it's like to stand on the scale. 
and to look at that number and think, ay, yay, ay, 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 I need to do something about this. This is getting worse and worse and worse. Hop off the scale and walk into the kitchen to eat and not do one thing about it, but all the while thinking that I have good intentions. Not today, but maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, I'm going to do something about this. And in fact, while you're eating and enjoying the food and your taste buds are just singing with joy and you're eating those carbohydrates and all those things which are making your situation worse, you've already forgotten about the number you saw on the scales. That's in the past already. Now you're totally imbibed in eating that food, making your situation worse. That's kind of what James is talking about. Well, let's bring this home. Maybe God's talking to you about your attitude. Wow. You see it? You understand what the Spirit of God is saying? He's telling you to repent, to change. But you don't take time to really deal with it. You don't even spend long in the presence of the Lord. You just recognize it. You hear what the Lord says. You see what the Bible says. And bam, you're on your way. You haven't had time to really deal with the issue. Or maybe there's something that needs to be corrected in your finances. And the Holy Spirit is telling you, telling you, telling you, fix this, fix this, fix this. And you keep saying, you know what, it's going to be hard to fix this. I will fix it, but I'm not going to fix it today. And you're on your way, spending more money, making more wrong financial decisions, forgetting what you were convicted about earlier in the day. Oh, this goes on and on and on. It could be the Holy Spirit, the Word of God speaking to you about your attitude toward others, something about your marriage, about your children about your attitude toward your boss or toward somebody in the church. The Holy Spirit is so kind. He'll confront us. He'll show you the real number. He'll tell you the real situation. When you look into the mirror, you'll see what you need to change. But you know what? Change is difficult for most people. So most people delude themselves into thinking it's not as bad as it looks. It's like people that are overweight. I'm not trying to pick on people that are overweight. I'm telling you, I understand that. People that are overweight usually don't see themselves the way others see them. They think that they look better than they look. They deceive themselves. Even though the scales say one thing or they look in the mirror and they see one thing, they dress themselves in such a way, in such colors that it doesn't reveal all the bulges and they think they look pretty good when in fact they don't look good at all. They deceive themselves. Here the Holy Spirit's trying to change them, save their life, prolong them, but they don't stay in one spot long enough to really do anything to change. That is exactly what James is talking about. That's just one illustration. Look at it again. For if any be a hearer of the word, the word speaks to you, convicts you, you hear the word, now you need to do it. But rather than do it, you don't take time to let it sink in, so you're just on your way. If any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man who beheld his natural face in a glass. He looked at the face he was born with. He really looked at it. But the next verse says he beholds himself and goes his way. He doesn't stop to do anything about it. And straightway forgets what manner of man he was, or he loses his conviction he forgets what the Spirit said. The Word doesn't really sink in. And listen to what the next verse says. But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man will be blessed in his deed. This verse is amazing. Look at it. Whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty... My goodness. Well, up until this time, James has been using the illustration of a hand mirror. Here's this person looking in a mirror, looking at himself. Well, he sees this little area where he needs to deal with himself, but he doesn't really do anything about it. But when you get to this verse, James says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty? And here we have the picture of a person who started with a hand mirror, he saw that area that needed attention, needed correction. And this person, rather than just rush and be on his way, he's so concerned by what he has seen that he goes to the table and on the table there is a table mirror. 
That's what the picture is here in this verse. Now he's hovering over the table mirror, which is a bigger mirror that he can look at more intensely. He's really looking into it because this is a man who wants to fix what's wrong. He wants to do what's right. He doesn't want to see it and then just run. He says, wait, 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 I'm not moving until I really see this clearly and bring a correction to my life. And now he's hovering over what the Bible calls the perfect law of liberty. It's talking about the Bible. It's talking about the Word of God. You see, to this man, a doer, the Bible is not just something that he hears. It's not just a message that's preached to him. It is the perfect law of liberty. Number one, it's a law. I live by this word. I obey this word. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to adapt my life to be in agreement with this word. To him, it is a law to be obeyed. And notice it's called the perfect law of liberty. The word liberty is the same Greek word which describes a slave that has been emancipated. This man understands, if I will submit to the Word of God, if I allow the Word of God to be a law in my life, if I look into the mirror of God's Word and see in the Word what in me needs to change, if I will live my life like this Word is a law to me, it will emancipate me. It will set me free. This is not a law of bondage. This is a law. This is a word that will free me like a slave that has been emancipated. That is so powerful. And then it says, and continues therein. He continues in it. He's not leaving the table until what he sees is fixed. It says, this man shall be blessed in his deed. The word blessed, the Greek word makarios, which means hilarious, hilarity. He's going to be so blessed he can hardly contain himself. That's what you feel when you get set free from yourself. You get really blessed that you made progress, that you broke free. But notice the Bible says he shall be blessed in his deed. One translation says shall be blessed in his work. That's the Greek word ergon, which tells us it takes work. It takes work. Obedience is work. It's work to obey the word of God. It is work to take what you've heard and to find a way to creatively do it. If you think you're going to do this easily, then just kiss it goodbye. It's not done easily. That's why the methetes, the learners, the students, it can also be translated disciples. It was going to take discipline. It was going to take effort. It was going to take work for them to obey Jesus, and that's what it's going to require of you. But if you will hover over the Word of God and say, I'm not leaving this table, I'm not leaving this Bible, I'm going to look into this Bible until I see what it says, I'm going to submit myself to it, it's going to set me free like a slave that's been emancipated, and then I'm going to find a way to do what the Word of God tells me to do. The Bible says, you will be filled with hilarity and laughter, blessed, as you do this work of the Word in your life. I'll be back in just a moment. I'm going to pray for you. Do you want to lead in life? Lead in your job. Lead your coworkers. You can learn to lead today with Rick Renner's book, Promotion. To be a leader, you don't have to be perfect, but you must be willing to grow. In this book, Rick answers the hard questions about the often misunderstood subject of leadership and how you can develop the critical character traits you need to get a promotion. Each chapter, Rick reveals the keys and questions for personal growth, as well as a comprehensive asset test for leadership. In this book, you'll learn the non-negotiable traits that determine if you or someone else is ready to progress in rank, position, or influence, and the practical ways to achieve your desired success. If you are already in leadership, Promotion teaches you the 10 keys every leader must apply to be successful and to build an unbeatable team and how to mentor promising leaders so they become top-notch producers who please God. When you call or go online today and get promotion, you'll learn the significance of the standards you keep and the relationships you hold. Whether you're seeking advice on when, how, and who to promote, or you want to hold a leadership position, Promotion prepares you for leadership. This resource is a trusted source of America's top leadership coaches. Order your copy right now for just $18. 
Don't miss this special offer. Promotion. Call now or go to renner.org to order. A big part of our ministry is praying for the people who support our ministry. By the way, if you're not a partner, I invite you to become a partner to help us take this teaching of the Bible around the planet. But a big part of our ministry is praying for our partners. We pray together. We have a whole prayer team that meets together to pray regularly for those who write to us or who call us or who email us. And we're very serious about prayer. And if you have a prayer need, we want to pray for you. I know that many times you don't know who to ask to pray with you. Or maybe you have a need that you don't feel comfortable sharing with somebody at your church. Call us. Write us. We'll pray for you. We would love to pray for the needs that you're facing in your life. We're here for you. And I want to remind you that right now I'm offering my book called 10 Guidelines to Help You Achieve Your Long-Awaited Promotion. The back of the book says, What does your life reveal about your readiness to be promoted into higher levels of authority and responsibility? And again, it's the book that I wish somebody had given me way back in the beginning when we were first getting started. This book is filled with years of mistakes and victories. And in this book, I share both what to do, what to not do. This book is filled with pearls of wisdom that cost me a lot. And I've written it for you to help you so you can really make some progress in your life. If you want to be promoted, you need to know what to do to be promoted. If you're in the business of looking for someone to be promoted, you need to look for what kind of people should be promoted. All of that is here. But I want to pray for you. Father, thank you in the name of Jesus for this amazing opportunity to be together today. What a pleasure. Thank you so much, Lord. We thank you that you are so good that you'll show us what we need to correct in our life. And you'll show us how to do the wonderful work of God. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. Remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power. Let God's word release its power in you. And I'll see you in the next program. Rick Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. 